Resilience is often touted as one of the most important characteristics that a doctor can have, but what exactly is it and why is it important? Hi everyone, Ollie here, welcome back to the channel. I'm a third year medical student studying at Warwick Medical School in the UK on the grad entry course. So resilience is one of the most important traits that a modern doctor can possess for a multitude of reasons. More commonly, this term is actually used to describe materials that a builder or engineer might use for something. If a material is resilient, that means it has capacity to return to its original shape after being kind of bent, pressed, stretched or otherwise deformed. Now obviously the NHS doesn't purposefully try and derange, bend, compress, twist its doctors um, in any purposeful way, but the job is extremely stressful at times and can be incredibly emotionally draining. So in terms of medicine, resilience means the capacity of doctors and other healthcare staff to bounce back as it were, after an adverse event, to maintain their skills and their sense of purpose so they don't leave the career, become de-skilled or have some other negative consequence happen. And obviously difficult events are commonplace within the modern NHS. Increasingly doctors are facing an aging population with multiple complex medical problems and comorbidities that all need managing at once, as well as declining levels of health within not just the wider UK population but also within their own profession. And if you couple this with the increasing levels of litigation and defensive practice that doctors are having to do, it makes the role of a doctor one of the most stressful jobs that exists in our modern society, let alone the consequences of any mistake they make in terms of what happens to their patients. And before we go any further, it's worth addressing the fact that there are a few false ideas of what resilience is floating around hospital corridors. If, for example, a doctor is underperforming um, on their unit after a particularly egregious mistake that they've made or a very emotionally difficult situation they have to deal with, um, the management could look upon that as well, you know, they're making mistakes, they're not up to par, they're simply not being resilient enough. And this view is obviously counterproductive. And the flip side to this is actually that resilience and resilience training has become a bit of a dark joke um, among doctors and among medical students because we are subject to the same resilience training as doctors are. It sometimes can feel like a bit of a buzzword that management and lecturers just throw around because it fills targets and it places the onus on staff, the burden on staff to have to change rather than addressing the systemic problems that actually cause these mistakes in the first place. So what does this mean um, when we're thinking about resilience in the modern medical workforce? It means that there is misunderstanding of what good resilience is, what good resilience behaviours are and what good training involves as well as a general lack of engagement sometimes with doctors and medical students with that training if trusts decide to provide it. But the reality obviously is, is that stress and emotional burnout are very, very real things. And they do of course mean different things to different people. What might upset me on the wards might not upset my clinical partner, but might upset one of the nurses. It's difficult to tell and you have to assess it on a case by case basis. But as medical students and as future doctors, we owe it to our patients to engage properly with the training where we can and to practice resilience ourselves to make sure that we're doing the best for them and that we don't make mistakes. Basically, we have to take care of ourselves in order to be able to take care of our patients. And resilience is very much a skill that has to be learned and has to be practiced I've not really ever met anyone who I think is instinctively very good at it. And that means that we have to seek help proactively if we're in a difficult situation, either emotionally, physically, spiritually, whatever, we have to look for help. And the GMC, this is really important, the General Medical Council who is in charge of registering who is a doctor and who isn't, places that burden firmly and squarely on the student or on the staff member. This is laid out in good medical practice that if you're affected by a situation or a condition that could affect your clinical judgment or clinical performance, the burden is on you to notify the right people and to seek help. And that's actually a fitness to practice level disciplinary offence if you're in breach of that. That sounds really harsh, particularly because you'll be dealing with a difficult situation and very stressed but ultimately it's not about us. If we make mistakes, it's the patients who suffer. 
that's why it has to be like that. You might also be asked to provide evidence of a situation in which you yourself had to show resilience. Maybe you failed an exam, or you performed poorly in a sports game, or you got fired from a job. How did you write yourself afterwards, if in fact you did write yourself? Did you deal with those difficult emotions yourself? Did you have to go and ask someone, whether it was family, friends, your coach, whatever, for advice? How did you first realise that something was actually wrong? Because often it does take someone else or an external agent to tell us or inform us that something doesn't seem right, and we're not always capable of realising that things are wrong in the moment. Although it's a little bit personal, I think that a toxic romantic relationship is actually a really good example of this. You're your mind restructures itself to prioritise staying in that relationship because it provides structure, it provides support at least some of the time, and it's easier to be able to rely on someone else than to be alone. So your tolerance of what is and isn't acceptable in your life actually chemically changes, and we're no longer able to perceive things the same way that we would have done before. And often in these cases we need someone else, whether it's a friend or a family member, to tell us that something doesn't look right and it's that that sparks getting out of that situation. So in my case, if I were asked to describe a situation in which I'd shown resilience, um, I did really, really badly in my AS level exams, the first year of A-levels when we used to do that. So I'd been a top grade student up to that point. You know, I was doing really well. I would regularly come top of the year. Um, in my exams, and I know that sounds a bit big-headed, but it's about to go downhill very quickly, so don't worry. And then after those AS level exams, I'm sitting looking at my results paper, and it shows that I've failed two exams and then done worse than average in the other three. And it took that external stimulus, that kick up the arse, for me to kind of realise that actually something is very wrong. I'd always assume that my academic ability would carry me through anything, because it had done so far, you know, on the limited evidence base I had, that made sense at the time, but obviously it didn't conform with reality. The changes in how you need to study and work at A-level just meant that that wasn't going to be true anymore. So now I've got my failure point, I've failed at something, and equally it took an external stimulus, that bad results paper, for me to even realise that something was wrong, when obviously clearly something had been going wrong for quite some time, I'd just either not admitted it to myself or not noticed it. So what did I do next? Well, I had to think about my priorities, obviously in this situation, what do I want? In my case, that was to become a doctor, right? That's still the goal. You have to have the want to change if anything is actually going to improve about your behaviour. You need a significant external drive. I disappointed myself, I'd certainly disappointed my teachers, and although I don't know whether my parents, they were probably disappointed for me as opposed to in me. So what did I do? Anyway, I spoke to my parents about it, I went and spoke to each of my subject teachers and we had a long conversation and put some goals in place and worked out what we were going to do. We set an action plan, a timeline along which we would meet in which I would do extra practice exams and in practicality I stayed at least two to three hours after school every single night for the next academic year. Um, was just revising that whole time, doing past papers, changing the way that I worked. And a big part of that was simply taking ownership of the fact that I myself was the problem. Um, there was something about my behaviour that was not right and I had to, again, really want to change. And I did, so my behaviour did change. Um, so then what happened is I took my AS level exams again alongside my A2, my, my A level final exam, so I sat two sets of exams all in one exam period. I did actually drop two of those subjects because again I just had to streamline very much towards achieving my goals. I came out with two A's and a B um, at A level. Now this is a better place to be in than where I was, but obviously not really good enough for medicine. Um, AAB is not good enough, particularly as I was missing that third A in chemistry. I was, I think, two or three marks, may not have been marks, may have been adjusted mark scores off that third A level. Um, I did send it to get remarked, came back exactly the same. So obviously I wasn't all the way there yet, but I was a step closer and that set the foundation for me to then go and complete my first degree. Uh, in molecular biology at Newcastle University. Because of my change in mindset, um, I was now able to, to work really quite hard for long periods of time. Um, I achieved a first class degree, which I'm still really proud of. And not only that, but I was able to build up a strong CV 
um, with which to apply to medical school and a lot of those skills that I learned during that time still serve me really well now. And now I'm at medical school, you know, and I've only got finals left. I'm nearly a doctor, fingers crossed. Um, one more set of exams before that's true. And the thing is, there were plenty of opportunities for me to give up along that entire path, which spans four or five years now. Um, I could have even dropped out of medical school. There are options for that. Um, but I didn't, and I like to think that that demonstrates at least some degree of resilience. And in fact, had I not had that negative experience where I'd failed that set of exams, I wouldn't have the same mindset that I do today. I wouldn't have been able to achieve um, all the things that I have been able to achieve, which I'm really happy I have. I've been able to meet some amazing people, get involved in some amazing projects, and be able to do things like this, where I get to talk to you guys um, and help you with your medical interviews. None of that would have happened, probably, because I wouldn't have had the drive and the self-belief to do any of it. So here we are. Ultimately, there is no silver bullet to questions like this. I know that sucks, but it's true. The basic steps for self-improvement and resilience are to recognize that something is wrong and get good at recognizing it early, if you can, and learning from previous experiences, thinking about how it affects you and other people that it might affect, getting help if you need it in order to put an action plan in place, and then actually fixing the problem, taking steps to achieve your goals. As long as you reflect on your experiences properly, think about all the things you've done, times that haven't gone quite as well as you'd hoped they would, but how you fixed it, and what you learned in the process of fixing it, which will often be more valuable than having achieved the thing first time, that's where the gold is for resilience questions. It's about thinking about your own experiences. And it's so much easier to tell your own story because you're just relaying facts that you know to be true. You don't need to embellish, you don't need to make things up. It's something that you can passionately deliver and be proud of, and that's what's gonna carry you through your resilience station. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com for more free videos and educational resources just like this one. The podcast forms of these videos has, has started to go live now. Those episodes are going up as quickly as I can get them online, available on Podbean and on Apple Podcasts now, I believe, hopefully soon on Spotify. If you want to support the channel, the best thing you can do is simply subscribe, comment, like, engage with the videos and share them with your friends that are applying for medical school. If you wanna buy me a coffee, you can use the Ko-Fi link in the description below. And it's essentially a small one-off payment, but no one needs to do this. this is completely optional. And if you're interested in using Complete Anatomy 2020, my favorite 3D anatomy simulation tool, there's a link in the description for 10% off your first year subscription. If you use my link, I get a small kickback and that helps support making more videos like this. Take care guys and I'll see you next time.